We have a division of our ministry, it's called Ghost Operations. It's the invisible hand into the closed world of radical Islam. And uh, we are, we've got over 400 pastors or missionaries in the underground in nine of the ten most dangerous Islamic countries in the world. When Afghanistan collapsed overnight, we had a real problem on our hand. We had 22 missionaries in Afghanistan in the underground. With their extended families, there were over 200 people. I got a call from our Dutch office, and they said, Wes, they are all expecting to be killed for their faith. We had one missionary that was uh, discipling three other Islamic families that had come to faith. Uh, the Taliban found them. Uh, they executed everyone from father down to children, even to the babies. And so uh, they said they're all expecting to be killed for their faith. And I went down to my staff and I said, guys, we're going into wartime operations. Uh, about a week later, four, uh, five former Navy SEALs would fly in, uh, three Marines, all Special Forces, one Army Green Beret, and one brother from the CIA. And we planned operations into Afghanistan. Shortly after that, we would go in with two teams simultaneously. Uh, the first one would fly in at a chopper. We would land at 12,000 feet, would deploy Marines and SEALs at that altitude. I went with the second team, and we thought we'd be climbing somewhere around two to 4,000 feet uh, up through the Afghan mountains, but it'd be, we'd actually have to climb to 11,500 feet uh, to get to our location. And guys, this is a very difficult climb. Literally, if you miss a step, you fall 1,000 feet and you die. There are no trails up there. I actually asked one of the guides if he uh, knew what the name of the mountain was. He goes, there's so many of them, we don't name them here. And I remember coming down the side of the one mountain, and I began to hear gravel uh, sliding, and I did not have time to think about it. I just reached back and I grabbed, and I caught our interpreter as he was going off the side of the mountain. And uh, when we got up to the top of the mountain, we launched our drones. And what we're looking for is what's called a rat line. A rat line is an escape route of how to get people out of Afghanistan. I can't go into the to further detail because this is an ongoing operation. Uh, you know, folks, when I got off the mountain, uh, Every, not just me, but everybody there, our toenails were black with the blood that was under them just from the difficulty of the climb. I actually lost two toenails on that mountain. Uh, we had one brother by the name of Rodney. Rodney was with the elite SEAL Team 6, uh, 22 years with the SEALs, 12 years with SEAL Team 6, and then 13 years with the CIA. And I believe that he lost three toenails on that mountain. So it tells you how difficult the climb was when we went up there. But then God began to do miracles. And guys, one of the things that I want to share with you is that so often when I come to churches, I hear this very common people say, well, that is Wes Bentley. But one of the things we need to realize, God works within our skill set, but he also does miracles far beyond our skill set. You know, as a group of men, every one of the guys that I took over there had multiple tours in Afghanistan, except for myself. My war was the southern Sudan. But we did not have a lot of the skill sets we needed for what we were trying to accomplish there. But then God began to do miracles. I uh, got a call from uh, Youth with a Mission, YWAM. They said our country's director is in the city of Maz. The Taliban knows he's there. They wrote a letter before the collapse of Afghanistan. And they said, we're going to butcher you. We're going to slaughter you. You're a traitor, Islam. There is no forgiveness for you. When they called us, they said, uh, listen, Wes, they are within two hours of finding this kid. Can you help us to get him out? And I go, guys, two hours is not a lot of time. You should have got a hold of us a long time before. But fortunately, on my staff, I had Luke. Uh, Luke spent 14 years Marine Special Forces, 22 years with the FBI, uh, counterterrorism. He speaks fluent Arabic in multiple dialects. He's literally tested at genius level. Plus, he's got a good grasp of five other languages. And uh, I had Brent also. Brent was in Second Force Recon, which is the lead of the Marine Corps Special Forces. And so I asked Brent and Luke to get on it. And fortunately, we were able to get a hold of one our, of our assets in country. An hour later, we showed up at the door. We picked the kid up and got him out of there. And an hour later, the Taliban was at the door. Had they not got there, he would have been killed. But then we got a call from Heather Mercer. Some of you might remember her. Heather Mercer is a very famous missionary. She was captured in prison by the Taliban. When the United States went in in 2001, she was released when the U.S. took over the prison there. And she said, I have 28 people in country. Uh, will you guys help me to get them out? They are all believers. We put together an operational team. We went in. We got them out also. But the one that surprised me the most is we got a call from Shannon Spann. She, uh, if that name seems familiar to you, 
Mike Spinn was the first CIA officer killed in Afghanistan back in 2001. I can remember it like it was yesterday, folks, because it really troubled me. Uh, Mike had been recruited by the CIA. He was in the Marines. He was in Special Forces. Shannon was also recruited by the CIA. They met at the farm, which is the training base. They fell in love, got married. And when uh, the U.S. went into Afghanistan, they were with the Alpha Team, which was the first team to go into Afghanistan. Shannon would later tell us that uh, uh, about how this came together, but she called us up, and I was not in the office at the time. She spoke to Brent. She goes, I have 26 people in country. They are not believers. They are Muslim, but they all help our country. If we don't get them out, they will all be murdered. Will you guys help us? And Brent called me up and says, Wes, what do you want to do? I said, let's green light the operation. We sent a team. We got those 26 out also. I actually got a call. The first female Supreme Court justice was in a certain city. And when the Taliban catches women, guys, they're particularly brutal. One of the things they do is they rape them because they believe by raping them, gang raping them, they cannot enter into paradise. Truthfully, it's a reason for just being a debased, disgusting human being. There is no excuse for what they do. But they will rape the women, then they'll strip them down, and they'll turn them upside down, and they'll cut their throats. So it was very critical that we get in there and got her. Fortunately, we're able to get in there and get her out also. Shannon actually flew out to California to meet with me, and uh, she told us that when Afghanistan began to collapse, because of her connections within the agency, she was getting a tremendous amount of people out. But when the last U.S. aircraft left, she said, I could not get anybody out of Afghanistan. She goes, uh, one night I was walking down and I was praying. I said, Lord, uh, I don't know what to do. And the Lord said, Shannon, why are you going to the world? Why are you not going to my people? And she goes, Lord, I don't know your people. And the Lord gave her a name. I do not know who this gentleman is. And he said, Shannon, call Far Reaching Ministry. So she called, and again, she spoke to Brent. Well, guys, she flew out to Southern California to meet with us. And uh, when she came out there, she said, you know, uh, after I was told to, to call you guys, and I believe the gentleman's name was Robert, she said, uh, I went to your website and I began to read it. And guys, if you're not a Christian and you don't understand it, it's very hard to understand because it looks very military like because we're involved in wars all over the world. We're involved in five different wars around the world right now. And uh, she said, so I, f I called him up and I said, Robert, who is West Bentley? Who is Far Reaching Ministries? Who is Brent? And he said, Shannon, if my family members were in Afghanistan, these are the two men I would want to go and get them out. Well, guys, one of the great things that's come out of this is she's now become a part of the team. So what we were missing on the intelligence side, Shannon has this very, very well down. And she can literally walk into any agency office in the world and get information that helps us to do our job over there. Uh, I later had a, a, a gentleman from the U.S. Intelligence Agency, and I won't name which one. He called me up and he said, can I fly out and meet with you? And I said, of course. Well, he literally flew out that day. I was kind of surprised by it. And he came to the office and he said, Wes, you are not aware of this, but the entire intelligence world is talking about you and your organization. And of course, you know, you're quite surprised to hear this. And I said, why in the world would you guys be talking about us? He goes, we're U.S. intelligence, and we can't get anybody out of Afghanistan. You're a Christian organization, yet you guys are getting all kinds of people out. What are you doing? So first thing I did is I opened up the Word of God and explained what it meant to walk with Jesus Christ for the next 45 minutes, you know. And, uh, you know, guys, it became a, a blessing. He's actually come to work for us. He still works for America, but... Uh, because they won't do their job. He's decided to help us. And the guy's a rock star in helping us to get people out of Afghanistan. But when I went back to Afghanistan in um, uh, January, he sent me a message there uh, through Signal. And he said, Brother, when I first met you, he goes, uh, I had been a Catholic, and I had walked away from faith many years ago. But after watching the way that your guys behave, he goes, I have surrendered my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And guys... Um, I tell people, for me, that's enough, guys. That's all I need in eternity to know that. Shannon would later tell us that uh, she is best friends with a New York Times best-selling writer. I guess he wrote the movie 12 Strong. Probably a lot of you guys have seen that movie. And uh, she, he actually called her up and he said, Shannon, what is in it for Far Reaching Ministries? She goes, nothing. He goes, no, really, what is in it for them? She goes, there's nothing in it for them. They're doing it because they love the Lord and they care about these people. He said, you know... Uh, and you got to realize this guy's a non-believer. He said, I've been watching both secular and uh, Christian organization. Everybody that's out there is trying to advertise himself. They're trying to get on the news. They're trying to get on television. They're trying to get interviews. They want the notoriety. They want the money that comes with that. 
except for far-reaching ministries. He goes, they're the only organization out there that is a ghost. And she goes, I'm telling you, it's because they love the Lord. And he's a non-believer, and he goes, you know, it's kind of like Jesus turning over the money changer tables. And guys, one of the things that I want to share with you is that when we are believers, one of the troubling things in the body of Christ today is that we see so many pastors trying to build their kingdom or their empire. We're not here to build our kingdom. We're not here to build our empire. Every pastor out there today wants to write a book. And I'm not saying there isn't some value in it. There is value in it. But, you know, I, I've actually had probably 20 people try to get me to write a book about the ministry. I had a Hollywood producer meet with me, and he was a real producer. He had worked with all the big stars, and he wanted to do a movie about my life. And I told him no. And he goes, Wes, I'm giving you what everybody dreams of. I said, everybody who's carnal. The Bible says that no flesh shall glory in the presence of God. And guys, one of the reasons I've turned down, and if the Lord ever tells me to write a book, I will do it. But see, I feel like we have the only book that the world needs right here. And so often we're trying to sell the world because of our testimonies and our personality. And instead of building God's kingdom, we're building our personal kingdom and our personal empire. And your rewards will be based on how you behave in eternity. You know, guys, when Afghanistan began to collapse, the Lord really dealt with me in this area. And, uh, you know, I've been in southern Sudan for 26 years, training chaplains for the South Sudan Army for the last 23 years. We're very well received within that government. I have great relationships with their leadership. I've led three of the commanding generals to Christ. And, uh, but... When, before I was in uh, uh, South Sudan, uh, I was in uh, Russia for five years. And guys, Russia was always my first love in ministry. Matter of fact, I never wanted to leave Russia to go to Africa. The Lord called me, and out of obedience, I did it. But Russia has always been my first love, and I try to go back there every year to do ministry. Uh, the biggest holiday of the year in Russia is not Christmas, it's New Year's. And they don't sell celebrate Christmas on December 25th. It's uh, Eastern Orthodox, which is January 7th. And, uh, and the biggest holiday of the year is New Year's, and uh, that's when they give kids gifts. And so they close down everything the 31st of December, and it doesn't reopen up until January 10th. And so it's a great time to go there, teach conferences, and do outreaches. And I love to go there during the wintertime, because in South Sudan, it is hot all the time. You literally sweat all the time. And I hate the heat over there, but it's where God has called me to be. So I love to go to Russia during the wintertime and the people. And please understand what's happening between Russia and Ukraine. This is not the fault of the Russian people. This is the fault of the leadership. Most of the Russian people do not want to be involved in this war. We've already had one of our pastors over there that we're supporting that has rescued 39 Ukrainian families, got them out of Ukraine through Russia into the country of Georgia, and they're extremely traumatized. We're taking care of them right now. Uh, but, I re but I remember that about four or five years ago, I, I was coming from the city of Yaroslava. Uh, we just bought a, a, a new car for a Baptist pastor. And guys, we're driving back, and it, we're driving through this blizzard. I mean, just snowflakes that are about the size of the quarter, and they're so thick you can only see about 30 yards in front of you. And I remember that as I was driving through this blizzard, it, it was just beautiful. I was enjoying it. But what the Lord sh spoke to me, he said, if the body of Christ does not respond about Af Afghanistan, Satan is going to harvest a blizzard of souls. And guys, that's exactly what is happening. There is a great massacre going on in Afghanistan. Uh, one, one of the things that kind of solidified it for me was a young girl. Uh, we did not get her and her family out of Afghanistan. They got themselves out. But I was asked by a youth with a mission to go and meet with them. We went to an Afghanistan restaurant in a bordering country. I cannot tell you where we were at. And when we got there, there was a mother and her mother. Uh, both mothers had had their husbands killed by the Taliban. The younger mother had two daughters at the time. One was six and one was four. Uh, when they escaped, she had a, a pretty much a newborn little boy. And they told us that the way the younger mother's husband was killed, the person who killed her, her husband was his own brother. He was a high-ranking Taliban officer he tortured his brother for three days. Guys, in my years of being in South Sudan, I've seen so many dead bodies because of the war. I have never seen anybody that was butchered this bad. He tortured his brother for three days. After he killed him, he raped his brother's wife, and he raped his brother's four-year-old uh, four daughter. 
And uh, the one that was actually the most traumatized was the six-year-old. The four-year-old, thank God, she doesn't really remember it. But the six-year-old witnessed the rape of both women, and she was extremely traumatized. And I'm talking to the mother, and uh, we've got this beautiful meal in front of us. And they're eating because of hunger, but there's no joy in their face. And guys, you know how it is when you've not had a good meal for a long time. When you eat, you eat with joy. You eat, there's a robustness about the, the excitement of eating food. None of that was there for them. And I noticed that immediately. The clothing they had on looked like they had not changed in weeks, if not a few months. And uh, the mother begins to tell me, she goes, my brother-in-law is contacting me through my other relatives. And he is telling me that if I do not return, he is going to murder all 14 members of my family. When she said that, the younger girl, the six-year-old, just began to weep and to sob. She was so scared of her mother going back. And I said to the mother, I said, Jesus said, come to me, all you burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I said, now you need to understand, you cannot put the safety of your adult family above that of these children. I said, that being said, if your family's willing to leave, I will send an operational team but you tell them that when we come, they have to leave immediately. If they do not leave, we're not coming back. And guys, we've been able to carry out that operation. When the mill was over, something surprised me. This young girl got up. And guys, children in Afghanistan do not show affection to men. They're afraid of them. But this little six-year-old came out, and, sh and she's not six anymore, but she put her arms around my waist, and she just began to sob and began to cry. And I leaned over and I kissed her on the head and I go, honey, do not worry. I will not let anything happen to you. And, you know, their clothing was rags, so we took them out to buy them clothing. And, uh, you know, the entire time I was there, that little girl would not let go of my hand. And uh, it almost became comical because, you know, we were trying to buy them winter clothing, play clothing, school clothing, underwear, all the things that children need. And uh, she would try to put on a shirt with one hand but hold on to my other one. And I told her, honey, you, gotta, you can let go and I'll take it back when you're done. After we were done, we took her and we bought her ice cream. And that was the first time I saw a smile on her face. And uh, when I went back in January, I found out she was telling everybody two weeks before I came, my grandfather's coming, my grandfather's coming. And guys, one of the things that I want to share for you, with you is that I believe as a body of believers that there is a time that God tell, calls us to take on a responsibility for other people. I felt like the Lord told me, this young girl... I'm giving you the responsibility of fathering her. You're to watch over her to make sure she gets to a safe nation, that they're fed, that they're housed. She won't live with you, but I'm putting you in charge of caring for her life. And I believe that God has called us as a body of believers to do that. One of my favorite people in the Word of God is the prophet Jeremiah. And guys, Jeremiah is very unique among prophets of the Lord. He's not only a prophet of the Lord, but he's a priest of the Lord. And what is unique about that there are only three prophets in the Old Testament that were priests. It was Jeremiah, Zechariah, and Ezekiel. And the job of the priest is to bring people into close fellowship with their God. Well, Jeremiah served somewhere between 40 and 50 years. And in the entire time that he serves, there's never a revival in the nation. The people never turn back to the God. Matter of fact, the Babylonian army comes in and destroys them because of their sin against their God. And yet, Jeremiah... If you look at his life, you might think that he failed in ministry. But see, guys, for Jeremiah did not fail in ministry. He just never lived to see the fruit of his ministry. But out of Jeremiah's life would come great fruit. Out of his life would come Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Out of his life would come the prophet Daniel. Out of his life would come Ezekiel. And when King Nebuchadnezzar built a golden altar and commanded the whole world bow down to it, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had seen what happened when a nation rejected their God. And they say, O King Nebuchadnezzar, whether our God delivers us or not, we will not bow down to your God. They're thrown into the, the fiery furnace and God, God delivers them. And an entire generation knows who the living God is. And it says that Nebuchadnezzar feared the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Seventy years later, it will be Daniel's time. Once again, called to worship a false god. He refuses, and he's thrown into the lion's den. Once again, he's rescued. And not only is he rescued, but all the evil leaders of that time are executed. They wipe out all the filth within the government of the nation. And another entire generation knows who the living God is. But then it's Ezekiel. And Ezekiel warns us, because we're living in a time where we are told that we're not supposed to be practicing our faith. If we confront people about sin... They're saying it's a hate crime in America. And guys, 
it's going to come and it's going to get worse and worse. But see, Ezekiel said, twice in Ezekiel, we're to go to the sinners, we're to tell them about their sin. If we do not go to the sinners and we do not tell them about their sin, God will require their blood on our head. And see, guys, we have a responsibility to tell people. Now, if they reject it, we're done. We're not there to batter them or to beat them up or to be cruel to them. You know, there's a great lie going on in America today. They're saying that the Christian community is really persecuting the homosexual community. And guys, that's not true. Matter of fact, by and large, the Christian community has been ambivalent. They've never cared. That's not the way they're supposed to. They're supposed to confront one. We're supposed to confront anyone who's living in a lifestyle that's contrary to God's word. But they're saying that it's being done. And the reason why is because they do not want the truth preached. But we have a responsibility to, out of love to save them from eternity without Christ. Over the years that I have been ministering, I have led 10 homosexual women to Christ. Not one man, but 10 women. And guys, I always tell them, I said, I want you to hear me out. I'm not a, I don't hate you. I don't dislike you. But according to Romans chapter 1, the Bible says you cannot practice this lifestyle or you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, if you reject what I said, we can leave, we can part in peace. And people will say to me, well, Wes, I was born this way. I said, I don't doubt that. But the problem with that is the serial killer will say he was born this way. The pedophile will say he was born this way. The guy that wants to sleep with every girl in his school will say he's born this way. Jesus said you must be born again. You must be born out of a life of sin into a life of purity. And guys, before I was a believer, I was a soldier. I lied about my age when I was in the 10th grade and joined the Marines. And I volunteered for combat duty in Vietnam. And I was a very highly trained soldier. I wanted to fight. I wanted to take human life. Now, I didn't want to be a serial killer, but I wanted to prove my mettle as a soldier. And what changed me was Christ coming into my heart. That's what took that out of my heart. And guys, one of the things about Jeremiah, in chapter 10, verse 23, Jeremiah says, I know, O Lord, that a man's life is not his own. It is not for man to direct his footsteps. Now, it doesn't read well in the King James Version, but it reads well in the NIV. And what he's saying is that our lives do not belong to us. If your life belongs to you, then you do not belong to the Lord. The Bible says he who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. And guys, we're supposed to be lost in Christ. We're supposed to find ourselves in Jesus. And this is what Jeremiah, Jeremiah would go through very hard times in ministry. And guys, in Jeremiah chapter 15, you see why Jeremiah was able to stand so fast. In chapter 15 and verse 16, he says, When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. For I bear your name, O Lord God Almighty. I never sat in the company of revelers, never made merry with them. I sat alone because your hand was upon me. And guys, as believers, this is the way we should be. We don't sit with those who scoff and do foolish things. We don't sit with the drunkards. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. We're there to be a witness, but we're not there to participate with them. This is what the mark of a true believer is. And guys, Jeremiah would go through many hard times. There would be times he was just beat up and he wanted to quit. And you know, you think after what he went through, God would say, I understand, Jeremiah, just hang on. But that's not what God says to him at all. Matter of fact, Jeremiah is going through a very hard time. And in chapter 12, verse 5, God says to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, if the foot soldiers have wearied you, how will you handle mounted horsemen? And the image that he's giving him was in the times of old when an army would come out. At first you would see the men with spears and swords and chain mail. But then came the heavy cavalry. And these are massive knights and massive horses with armor on them and long spears and they would begin to walk and trot, and then they're in a full charge, and these massive spears are coming down at you. And it must have been terrifying. But what God is saying to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, if the foot soldier has wearied you, how will you handle mounted horsemen? You know, guys, for me, we've been involved in the war in South Sudan for 26 years. In Nigeria, we have a village that we're working with. There's over 400 women whose husbands have been killed by the Islamic Fulani tribes. It's like a war zone. All of them have been raped, and we're trying to protect these women. In Burma, the same thing is going on. They're killing the Christians in Burma. Now we have the war in Afghanistan. We have already rescued almost 1,000 Afghanis. The problem that we're having is every U.S. agency, every foreign government, to our knowledge, every humanitarian group has pulled out of Afghanistan. 
we're the only ones left, and there's, we have over 3,500 requests to get more people out. And guys, we're going to keep going after them until we can anymore. When the war in Ukraine started, I actually prayed and said, Lord, are you actually calling me to get involved in another war? And the reason why I even considered it is because we had 40 pastors in the Ukraine. Do we get involved? We have four of the wars. We're, we're literally stretched as much as we can be. And the Lord spoke to me in Proverbs. In chapter 24 and verse 10, it says, If you falter in times of trouble, how small is your strength? Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay each person according to what he has done? Now, guys, sometimes you think, God, I can't take on anything else. But right now we're feeding 15,000 people every day. And we committed to three months of that. I've got guys coming in from the 75th Ranger Regiment that are going to do combat medical for the Ukrainian Army. i got Marine SEALs and Army Special Forces coming in to teach other skills that they need to protect themselves. And yet it is the step of faith of trusting the Lord. You know, guys, I flew to Amsterdam on April 4th. On April 6th I had a dream. I have been a believer for 46 years, guys. I have never been high in my life. I've never taken drugs. I have never wanted to. The last time I was drunk was 46 years ago. I, the thing about alcohol, I didn't have to go through a program to give it up. I fell so in love with the Lord and God and serving him, I just didn't want it anymore. And that's the road to how you break free from this stuff. You fall in love with the Lord. But I had this dream, and in 46 years of being a believer, I've only had three other dreams that I thought were from the Lord. And guys, I went to sleep, and in my dream, I dreamed that there was a pastor, uh, Billy Rutledge from Calvary Chapel, Hatters Island. He was over there. He was doing ministry with all the soldiers, and Billy's like that. He'll go any place in the world to do ministry. And he'd gone missing in my dream. I think God uses things like that to, to speak to you. Well, I was looking for him, and I came to a certain city, and he wasn't there, but they told me there was a sniper killing a lot of civilians. And I was a professional shooter in the Marine Corps. My coach said that I was so good with weapons, he thought I could shoot the Olympics. I didn't want to shoot the Olympics. I just wanted to shoot other people, so I had no interest in doing that. But I remember in my dream, I said, listen, I'm a professional shooter. I'll deal with this guy. And in the dream I did, I shot him. I kept looking for Billy, and... Every time I was looking for them, they was, every time there was a sniper killing civilians, they would call me, and I would come in and deal with it. Well, one day they called me, and they said, there's a sniper in a high-rise building. We can't get to him. Every time we approach the building, he kills us, or who's ever trying to get in there, and he's killing a lot of people. And I said, guys, don't worry about it. I'll deal with it. Well, guys, it's funny, because in the dream, I entered the building with another sniper, and I knew who he was in the dream. But for the life of me, I cannot remember anymore. Since I woke up, I couldn't remember who he is. And I remember telling this guy, I said, listen, we're going to clear this floor by floor. I'll take the lead, but you need to watch. I don't want them coming up behind us and shooting us if we miss them. And we got up to about the 18th floor, and I rounded the corner, and there was carpet on the floor with plastic sheeting, and it was moving. And I immediately raised my weapon to fire, because that's a trick of snipers to hide from a concealed position and fire. But the Lord told me, do not fire. So I kept my weapon trained on it, but I approached softly, and I reached down, and I pulled back the carpet. And when I did, there were four little boys under it, all between the age of about three and five. And they were extremely afraid. And I looked at the little boys, and I said, where are your parents? And they go, we don't know. I go, do you boys want to come home and live with me? And they all got up and they came and they put their arms around my waist and they started to hug me. And I woke up, guys, and in my entire life as an adult, I have never woke up with tears in my eye. But I woke up and tears were coming out of my eyes. My wife, Vicki, it was 4.30 in the morning. I think she got up an hour earlier. She was studying and uh, she was shocked to see this. She, she, Vicki's never seen me cry. And she came over and she goes, honey, what's going on? And I began to retell her the dream. I said, Vicki, I felt like this had some kind of spiritual significance. I don't know why. Is the Lord telling me those boys are out there and I need to find them? Or what is he trying to say to me? <clears throat> well, we both believed that we needed uh, interpretation, so I to called two godly men who were both gifted. And God gave me the interpretation, guys. And what he showed me was that 
there are thousands of children out there that have lost their families and they're afraid. Mom and dad went off to get food or firewood or water and they just didn't come back. And there's orphans all over the Ukraine now. We started to feed people in the Ukraine from almost the onset. And guys, we had bread lines that went a half a mile long. But we realized there were a lot of elderly that could not get there, so we're going door to door. Well, we got to a certain house, and when we got in, the lady told us that she had planned to kill herself that day. She had a daughter that had been killed in a car accident five or six years ago. But when Russia invaded the Ukraine, her second daughter was in a house, her apartment. And I don't know if it was a rocket or an artillery shell hit the house but it vaporized her daughter. They couldn't find any part of her, and she decided to kill herself. Well, we prayed with her and led her to Christ. And she told us, she goes, I won't kill myself. I believe that my daughters are believers, and I will see them again. But in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Ukraine, there are many people committing suicide, especially among the elderly. And the reason why, guys, is because they can't rebuild. They don't have the money. Their pension is $100 a month. How do you rebuild a life from that? And they've lost all hope and they're killing themselves. And I believe that God wants the body of Christ to respond and to care for these people. You know, when I was on top of that mountain, there was a real realization that I could lose my life. But guys, when Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of your faith, you can have great peace. And I am very aware that I am following the God of angel armies. And at his command are legions of angels, should he choose to send them. I believe with the Lord, two people can change the world, or even one. When we trust the Lord, the very act of faith, the very act of obedience, moves the hand of God very powerfully on our behalf. And I want to encourage you as a group of believers that God wants to use you. Guys, me being a soldier doesn't make me more spiritual. I think people look at us and say, well, these guys are tier one type of guys, and, you know, of course they can do this. We're all called to different ministries. We all have different callings in our life. I remember back in 1984, I went to Mike McIntosh's School of Evangelism down in San Diego. And during a midweek study, Mike McIntosh came out on the stage, and he said, hey, one of the ladies didn't show up for child care. Could we get a volunteer? Not one single woman raised her hand in that room. I wasn't going to raise my hand. There were hundreds of women there, but not one raised their hand. So using a great lack of discernment, I raised my hand. See, these ladies knew something I didn't know. I got the four-year-olds. I would rather be back in, Tal in Afghanistan fighting the Taliban <laughs> than go through that experience again. See, we're all gifted for different things, and God wants to use you with your gift. Paul the Apostle, in the book of Romans, he said daily they prayed for boldness. So if you're afraid to share your faith, pray daily for boldness. Paul said, stir up the zeal that's within you. And guys, what it means is return to your first love. A lot of people became believers 20, 30, 40 years ago. But time has gone by. You're not as active as you used to be, and you've just lost that fire. But guys, the Lord wants you to stir up the zeal that's within you. Remember the former days. Remember what it was like when you first became a believer in Jesus Christ. For me, it was extremely exciting. But I've never lost my zeal. I found great joy in doing it. We have a video we're going to show you guys. And guys, the first part of the video is of the Syrian church. It's difficult to watch, but also inspiring. The second part, you'll see our chaplains, and you'll see all the chaplains that have been killed in the service of Jesus Christ. So let's go ahead and show that, guys. When the war start, many problems happened, and it's so difficult to continue the ministry. And uh, we know some some day uh, the problems is come inside our homes, not just in our city or in our area. Um, at that time, I speak to the leaders, and uh, we met together. And I said, as in Acts book, the believers when they have the persecuted most of them they go out of Jerusalem. 
if you want now to go out of your area or out of Syria to save your families, this is good if God gave you this to do. But uh, we, we must to know maybe one day the problems come to our families and to our life. And maybe we will lose our life one day. You know, when I left the room and after a time I turned back to see the decision of the leaders, I found 25 people. They stand there and they said, we will not leave, we will continue to serve God here in this area and we will continue the ministry. If we are die, we will go to Jesus. And if we leave here, we will be with Jesus. And you know, but they asked me something to do. They said, if one of our team die, you know we are non-Christian background and no one will take care about our body if we killed or something happened to us. Uh, what we can do if this happened? For that, we buy this land and we built a graveyard. This graveyard for if anyone killed from our team, we can put him there. This is the first building of our ministry. I think it first uh, happened in Raqqa city in Syria. They give the chance for the uh, Christian. They said to him, if you leave your Christianity now, you can be, uh, hold your life, or if not, we will kill you. This, this decision is, you, you know, it's must to, to, to take it directly. And most of the uh, Christians said, no, we are ready to die for Jesus. And for that, they, uh, you, you can see many uh, pictures about the Christian, they put them in the cross. And when they put them, many times they put in the uh, area, all the people can see them. To learn the people, if you will be Christian, this is your, what will happen to you. Uh, and uh, most of the people, I thank God for these uh, heroes in the faith. They die for Jesus and they put them in the cross. You remember when I told you about the stories about the man who uh, was his son and uh, they bring them and they ask them to leave uh, them faith in Jesus Christ. But the father said no and the son said no. And they ask the father, if you don't uh, come to Islam now, we will, we will kill your son in front of your, your eyes. And after that, they cut the head of the son and they start to play football in his head, front of his father's eyes. This is something incredible. You cannot understand what's happened. But through all this bad news, you can see the hope is growing between this uh, uh, difficult and uh, bad people. You know, so sometimes many people ask me why, why you continue in the ministry in Syria, especially in this time in the war. The important things for, uh, for our life to be in God willing. This is our call from God to, uh, to do the ministry in Syria. When we are inside the, the God willing, that means we are in the safe place. But if we are go out of God willing and go out of Syria, that means we are in the dangerous place. Maybe I, I can go like to Lebanon, to Jordan, to US, to, to anywhere and continue my life there. But that means I am go out of God willing. That means I am in dangerous. The important things in our life, not to be alive, but to be with Jesus willing. But if I am in, inside the dangerous, but in God willing, that means I am in the safe place. This is my belief and I trust in Jesus. He will keep my life. And when he wants me to go to him, I am ready to do this.
my father's arms on me The wounds this world left on my soul I'll be healed and I'll be whole Sun and moon will be replaced With the light of Jesus' face And I will not be ashamed For my Savior knows my name It don't matter where you bury me I'll be home and I'll be free It don't matter where I lay All my tears When I go, don't cry for me in my father's arms on me the wounds this world left on my soul I'll be healed and I'll be whole sun and moon will be replaced with the light of Jesus' face and I will not be ashamed For my Savior knows my name It don't matter where you bury me I'll be home and I'll be free It don't Sun and moon will be replaced with the light of Jesus' face. I'll be home and I'll be free. The number just rose to 70. John Abel was shot and killed two weeks ago Wednesday in the service of our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, we have lost 70 members of our staff serving Christ in the southern Sudan. But the thing that you need to understand is we are winning the war for the gospel. We are seeing a nation where many are coming to Christ. Literally by the tens of thousands, we are seeing them come. And if you're going to be in a war zone, you have to be prepared to take casualties. I think that we need to understand as, as believers, God wants us to have an empathy for those that are lost in darkness. We're supposed to care for those that are suffering. The Bible says we are to remember those who are suffering as though we are suffering with them ourselves. During the Second World War, a ship came from Nazi Germany to America. It had 973 Jewish people on it. All that was needed was for America to allow them to be, stay here. But we sent them back to Nazi Germany. Mothers, children, elderly people. They were put in concentration camps and worked and starved to death. And then they were incinerated. America hasn't learned a lot in the last 75 years. See, this is not the heart of God. And our hearts should be moved by the things that move the heart of God. We should care for those that are suffering. You know, guys, the Bible says to whom much has been given, much shall be required. You guys have been blessed. You're, you have a pastor that has a pastor's heart. I have listened to Dave on the radio. I've actually called him at times because of messages that he was talking about. And I realized that he has a pastor's heart. A lot of men who are in ministry don't have a pastor's heart. They're in ministry because they're gifted. They may be good at it. They may be called. But they don't have a love for the flock the way that your pastor does. 
I thought about being a pastor once, but I realized that you had to like people, so I chose to be a foreign missionary. But to whom much has been given, much shall be required. In closing this morning, I want to encourage you, and guys, we want to give you an opportunity. The first thing that I'd like to say is we do not want you to take this out of your church tithing if you want to participate. Uh, we are not a small organization. Financially, we are actually larger than most of the large Calvary chapels. Last year, in Mexico alone, I think we built 10 houses for women last year. In Africa, we probably built 40 homes for people. Uh, we built seven churches in Russia. We built two castles in Africa. One's is, both of them are schools. And the castle is to protect people from Islamic terrorism. But in the Ukraine right now, there are so many elderly people that do not have enough to eat. We started a program in Russia called Potatoes for Grandmothers, and it was literally meant for the body of Christ. It was never meant to be a big thing. We weren't trying to create a big thing. But I would go to the houses of believers, and elderly people would say, Wes, we drink milk twice a year, and meat does not exist in our diet. So we wanted to feed them, and we started raising sponsors, and it's called Potatoes for Grandmothers. Well, guys, now we're gathering hundreds of names of people in the Ukraine. And if you would like to sponsor one of these, it's $75 a month. And again, guys, like I said, there are people out there, you're doing everything you can to make it. And tithing is difficult for you. Well, you're doing your part. But others of us have been blessed. And if you can afford after you tithe to sponsor, then we welcome it. We also have the children in Africa. We have a children of war program. We have built a school out there that has uh, 400 kids in it. We have 300 more that we need sponsored. That's also 75 and then our ghost operations, we have pastors in the underground and radical Islamic countries. And guys, like I said, we're in nine of the ten most dangerous nations. We have 400 in the underground, but we, we're waiting for uh, another 300 to be sponsored. We have uh, just taken on 100 missionaries in Nigeria. The Fulani tribe believe that they brought Islam to Africa, and they're very vicious in killing people. Well, they had one of the Fulani members who got saved, and he went back to his own people. They told him if he did not come back to Islam that they would torture him and kill him. Well, he refused, so they skinned him alive. But what happened was 100 Fulani came to Christ, and now we're training them as missionaries to send them back. So we need sponsors for them. I share with people, people ask me this every Sunday, guys, and this is the only reason I say this, is people will say, well, what if I want to do all three? Well, guys, if you're one of those few people that God has really blessed you financially, you can pay your bills, you can tithe, and you really do want to do all three and store treasures in heaven, then it's 225. This is an automatic debit. It comes out on the third of each month. Do not pick them up and walk away with them. I will not know if they're sponsored. You have to give us name, address, phone number, sign it at the bottom. Voidy checks work best because we don't pay fees, but you can use debit or credit cards. And if you don't have all of your information, you can fill out as much as you want, and Ed Gott, my assistant, will call you on Tuesday to get the rest of it. Guys, let me share this with you, and then I'm going to ask your pastor to come up and close. The way that we, salvation is a free gift of God, but the rewards of heaven are earned. And guys, if you never do anything for Christ, why do you expect great treasures in eternity? You need to begin sharing your faith. It should not be once in a lifetime. We should look for every opportunity. Every week you should be inviting someone to church. And if you're afraid, pray for boldness. I share with you that, again, we're a very large organization. You know, guys, it was interesting because during the year of COVID, I think all ministries thought we'd lose most of our support. Well, we started getting calls to feed people all over the world. I think we're feeding over 4,000 people in Mexico for three months. And instead of our donations going down, it was the biggest year in the history of our ministry. We brought in seven and a half million dollars. Well, last year before Afghanistan happened, I told the staff, I think the Lord is telling me he's going to double the size of our ministry. But that doesn't make any sense. When you work for years to get to a certain point, how do you double in one year? Afghanistan happened. We did not do Afghanistan because of looking for anybody to know us. We're just trying to save our people. Well, last year our donations were $12.5 million. And this year we're headed towards $15 million, maybe sixteen. million. See, the very act of faith, the very act of trusting moves the hand of God. 
And one of the things that I found, I find great joy in giving, guys. I really do. I've been very successful in business. I've actually been able to cover my salary for all the years I've been in ministry. And beyond that, give another $8 million to the ministry. I don't do ministry because I need a paycheck. I do ministry because I love Jesus Christ. And guys, I don't want to waste my life living in luxury and trying to have the best of homes and the best of everything. It doesn't, it doesn't mean you can't enjoy your wealth. You can. But for the most part, I want to use my wealth to win souls for the kingdom. The great privilege of my life has been to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. It has been the greatest experience I have ever had. And guys, every time I step into the pulpit, I thank God, because I know that one day I'm going to step into the pulpit for the last time, and I'm going to go home to be with the Lord. And I want to savor it. Pastor.